Good morning and welcome. And uh, thank you for inviting me here to speak today. I'm Tanya Townsall. As Jim said, I'm Fort McCoy Public Affairs Officer. And I want to tell you a little bit about Fort McCoy today. To start off with, Fort McCoy is the largest Army post in the northern Midwest. And it's located between Sparta and Toma, as you know. Um, if you, you feel like it, could, could you guys let me know if you've been to Fort McCoy before so I have an idea? Okay, so a, a good amount. And if you haven't, I hope you learned something about Fort McCoy as we go along. So as you can imagine, for an installation that's over 100 years old, there's a lot of history. And so like most things, I'd like to start at the beginning with the history of the installation. So Fort McCoy is named for Robert Bruce McCoy, who was born in Kenosha in 1867. And it is unusual for um, an installation to be named after the person who founded it. So that's one unique thing we've got going for us. Another thing is that we have a distinct logo. The, it'll come up later. There's a triad symbol that we have a logo for Fort McCoy. And that's um, based on the shape of the installation. So Robert Bruce McCoy was a lawyer, a district attorney, a county judge, and mayor of Sparta. And he was practically everything. Hey, he was a Renaissance man. In fact, he ran for the governor of Wisconsin. So McCoy's military career began in 1895, and he served for 31 years. And this time included duty during the Spanish-American War, the police action in Mexico, and World War I. Because of his experience during the Spanish-American War, McCoy had the foresight, I think I got that. He had the foresight to realize that in future conflicts, which were inevitable, weapons would be improved upon and training had to be emphasized. So after he returned from the Spanish-American War, McCoy envisioned an artillery camp suitable for training soldiers. He envisioned it would be situated in the low pastures and wooded hills surrounding Sparta. So he started buying small tracts of land which he rented for grazing, and he used that rent money to finance additional land purchases. And eventually he, re he acquired 4,000 acres. And he had a plan. That plan looked suspiciously like the shape that Fort McCoy is today. The triangular shape was ergonomic because the word ergonomic didn't exist, um, but the layout was designed and arranged so people on the installation interacted most efficiently. Dining facilities, barracks, motor pools, headquarters, these all design, were designed and arranged so as little time as possible was wasted moving from one to another. Remember, they mostly walked in those days. Anyway, back to the history. In 1906, then Secretary of War, William H. Taft advocated the building of four large maneuver camps across the nation. These camps were to be used jointly by the regular army and the National Guard. They initially looked to buy land that was cheaper down at Camp Douglas, but when local landowners heard the news, the land prices skyrocketed about tenfold, from about $3 an acre to $30 an acre. Then the McCoy property started looking pretty good. And remember, there was already a plan. So the increase in cost and other recommendations led to the decision for the purchase of the McCoy property and additional land of about 14,000 acres. So let me discuss a little bit about the McCoy Ranch. Major Samuel Allen, who was the commander of the 7th Field Artillery at Fort Snelling, Minnesota, also admired the terrain of the Sparta area for its training value. And in September of 1905, McCoy invited Allen's unit, along with the Army Board of Reviewing Officers, to put the land to test during 16 days of training at his family's ranch. In 1906, Taft advocated this, and then um, they appreciated what it had to offer. And so he had been selling it all along. And we move on to uh, later 1909, Camp Robinson and Camp Emory Upton. Negotiations were concluded and the Sparta Maneuver Track became a reality in 1909 on what is known today as the South Post. So South Post is south of Highway 21. The total parcel was divided approximately in half by Chicago, Milwaukee, 
St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. Uh, situated north of the tracks was Camp Emory Upton. The artillery camp known as Robinson went up to the south tracks. And temporary uh, galvanized buildings were constructed in the summer of 1909 and training began. And the railroad provided an unloading sidetrack near the artillery camp and ran a spur to the maneuver camp because back then railroad was how you got things moved. And then Camp Robinson prepared to receive its first soldiers. And the first unit arrived was a medical unit from Fort Russell, Wyoming. So it really was becoming the focus of Northern um, US, especially the Midwest. And uh, then we move on to World War I and there were improvements and additions made between 1910 and 1919. And they included rifle ranges, office buildings, storehouses. And until 1919, the camp, camp was a favorite for artillery and was at the same time um, described as the largest, most modern and most beautiful in the nation. And it continued to grow through World War I with the construction of more barracks, mess halls, stables and warehouses and built artillery units uh, continued to train through World War I and through 1918. Then the Sparta Ordnance Depot uh, came around in 1919. So training stopped from 1919 to 1923 and the reservation was designated the Sparta Ordnance Depot. The primary function of the camp personnel and facilities was to handle, ship, and uh, handle, store, and ship explosive materials. Thousands of uh, tons of powder and Pyrex cotton, which is a highly explosive substance made of cotton treated with nitric and sulfuric acids. I'm just throwing that in there because you guys might be interested in that. They were shipped for storage uh, to portable magazines, highly explosive. And then from 1923 to 1925, the U.S. Department of Agriculture acted as custodial agent for the camp as activity centered on dismantling the wartime barracks and the deactivation of the Ordnance Depot. The powder was processed at the depot and sold as dynamite to the commercial market. Lumber salvaged from the dismantled barracks was used to box and ship surplus powder to other government owned depots. I don't know if that breaks your guys' heart thinking about all that old wood that went there. In 1926, on November 19th, the reservation officially was designated as Camp McCoy in honor of Major General Robert Bruce McCoy who had died in January. The War Department once again regained control of the camp as it settled down to improve buildings and roads. Summer artillery training was conducted from 1926 to 1933 by units from Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. So training continued. And here's another interesting part. The Citizens Military Training Camp was also established at Fort McCoy. They were authorized by the National Defense Act of 1920 as an extra measure in preparing the nation's military uh, for readiness. And the camps provided an introduction to military training for young men of high school age or college age to prepare them for the reserve and National Guard duty. We're still pre-World War II here. And then we move into the um, Civilian Conservation Corps. In 1933, the camp had another mission and it was a supply base for the CCC, which was a New Deal program during the Great Depression designed to provide jobs at about $30 a month, plus uniforms, lodging, and food. The program was supervised by the Army and the quasi-military nature of the organization led to Army careers for many young men. And nationwide, as you're probably aware, the CCC spent nearly $3 billion, putting about 3 million um, youths, war veterans through conservation school and health programs. So their operations continued at the camp until 1939. After this period, the camp was put on standby status with only a quartermaster detachment and civilian maintenance personnel left behind as caretakers. Then we move into the boom, which is World War II. 
So the lull was only temporary as another world conflict uh, that could involve the United States was looming on the horizon. Training needed to be intensified and the camp was chosen as the site for the second army maneuvers in August 1940. So 65,000 soldiers from seven states participated in the maneuvers and they made up the largest troop concentration in the Midwest since World War I. In the summer of 1940, the last of those horse-drawn artillery left the post. Then there was new land and new construction. So by now, the camp was at full utilization and needed to grow. More than 45,000 acres were added between 1938 and 1942. This addition added construction or included instru construction in 1942 of the large triangular containment area referenced as the new camp. That's what you see inside the gates if you visited Fort McCoy. <clears throat> so this still serves as the installation's containment area today. Congress allotted funding for the construction of the facilities large enough to house train and support 35,000 troops. And it was inaugurated in 1942. At that time, some 8,000 local workers participated in this building construction. You can imagine that coming to Fort McCoy back then. And the triangular shape of the containment area or the triad was designated to allow those troops to live and train effectively under one headquarter just like it had originally been set up. And then more than 1,500 buildings were constructed at an estimated total cost of $30 million. And those more than 1,500, build, 1500 buildings went up in just a matter of months. Did I say? Okay, I'm gonna to describe to you. There are words, there are letters, and some of these have pictures. <laughs> you can just imagine that. Um, so prisoners of war, what's really interesting is in addition to the, um, the former CCC discharge and reception center located on South Post um, was converted into a prisoner of war and relocation camp. And I know that Robin's go Ryan's going to come in later and talk about that. So that is just absolutely fascinating. I, I don't yeah. have to have All it right. at this point. Yeah. Um, so the camp was the largest holding facility for Japanese POWs in the, in the continental United States. That's pretty amazing. And it also housed several thousand Germans and Korean POWs. And Fort McCoy is unique in Army history as having housed uh, relocated Japanese Americans as well as German Americans from the West Coast and uh, European and Japanese prisoners of war captured during World War II. And we also, somebody was saying earlier, we had the first, uh, we had the first Japanese prisoner of war. We had him twice. He came from Pearl Harbor. He was brought to Fort McCoy, then moved elsewhere, and then brought back to Fort McCoy later on. And uh, just taking an aside from that, we've had visitors, uh, descendants of those POWs from Japan. And one really interesting story was there was the grandson as well as the nephew of one of those POWs. And the family didn't know, they, they came and visited Fort McCoy. The family did not know that he had been a prisoner of war until much later because he'd already always spoken so fondly of being at Fort McCoy. And they thought he was stationed here during the war. So that, that says something about uh, the way that um, uh, the people in the area treated the prisoners of war. So we also um, had the first unit to train at the new camp after its inauguration was the 100th Infantry Battalion, and it was comprised of Hawaiian National Guardsmen. And they were Americans of Japanese ancestry. And the 100th served with distinction in Italy, suffering severe casualties while establishing one of the most outstanding battle records of any unit in World War II. More than 9,000 Purple Hearts were awarded to the members of this battalion. 
and the 100th lead in training here was followed shortly afterward by the 2nd and the 76th Infantry Divisions. But I suspect many of you know about this unit. So other activities. During World War II, a variety of other activities also went on at the camp. The nation's first Ordnance Regiment came to Camp McCoy after basic training in North Carolina. An induction of basic training center for Army nurses was set up and a limited school service was established to train physically disabled soldiers as several specialist fields. Building a new recreation and welfare facility continued and a bakery opened to supply the post and Camp Williams, uh, the, to supply the post, Camp Williams and a radio school in Toma. And then in 1945, the post missions was changed to that of reception and discharge center for soldiers returning from overseas. Uh, men from Wisconsin, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Michigan and Montana were processed and discharged in its year of operation. The center processed one year, nearly 250,000 soldiers, nearly a quarter of a million. They were processing uh, generally more than 30,000 soldiers a month. It was just phenomenal. In 1946, training had nearly stopped except for the 1,800 troops of Task Force Frost, whose mission was to test winter clothing and equipment. And they trained here until the late spring of 1947. And for that time, uh, during mid-1947, the post was an induction center for men from throughout the Midwest processing here before heading to training centers across the country. In June 1947, the camp was put in an inactive status. Reserve and National Guard units still use it as summer training camp for the next few years. Then the camp was reactivated in September 1950, shortly after the conflict in Korea started. The camp survived, or the camp served as a major training center for the 5th Army area, preparing soldiers for battle in Korea, and the peak strength reached after activation was about 19,000. Earlier in the same year, the post was considered for a possible site for the U.S. Air Academy. In 1951, the camp again became a reassignment and separation center. Before the center closed its doors in 1953, more than 15,000 men were separated from service and another 18,000 men had been reassigned to other posts, so significantly lower than the quarter of a million. In 1952, Camp McCoy came to the aid of the civilian community during the polio ap epidemic, and more than 100 civilian patients were treated at the station hospital. And those busy days were short-lived. In November 1952, the Army announced it would curtail operations at Camp McCoy for economic reasons. Sol soldiers stationed here were reassigned, and on February 1st, 1953, the post again deactivated. However, Camp McCoy continued to be used as a site uh, where Reserve and National Guard units conducted annual training during the summer seasons. In 1955, the Wisconsin State Patrol established a training academy including housing at uh, Camp McCoy. So the, the, um, the State Patrol has a long history at Fort McCoy and they're, they're great neighbors to have. Camp McCoy made headlines in the winter of 1959 when the post was considered as a possible site for an intercontinental ballistic missile base. The Army opposed the idea and resisted Air Force efforts to have the ICBM launch site located here, uh, reasoning that the Army may need all of Camp McCoy, which was still de uh, deactivated. Uh, they might need it at some later date. And uh, maybe many of us took I-90 here in 1962, the state of Wisconsin was granted a right-of-way easement over 400 acres of Camp McCoy property in order to build Interstate 90. The borrow and fill removed from these three locations parallel to the interstate resulted in three man-made lakes now known as Big Sandy, Sandy, and West Sandy. The lakes are now very popular fishing and recreation areas. 
In the 1970s, as the regular forces shrank, the greater responsibility was put on reserve and National Guard forces. The camp was reactivated and permanent party staffing established to accomplish its mission of supporting reserve and national training. And here's where we move on. With the Department of Army General Order Number 45, the camp was officially renamed Fort McCoy on September 30th, 1974. The designation recognized Fort McCoy's status as a year-round Army training facility. Uh, Cuban resettlement happened in 1980. In May, Fort McCoy was designated as a resettlement center for Cuban refugees who came to the United States when Fidel Castro allowed them to leave Cuba as part of the Freedom Flotilla and approximately 15,000 Cubans were housed here through October. And troop training activity continued to grow throughout the 1980s, as did the number of permanently assigned civilian and military personnel. So Fort McCoy's off-post support missions also grew significantly in the 1980s. Today, Fort McCoy has one of the largest off-post support missions of any Army installation, with services being provided to federal agencies throughout the upper Midwest. In 1984, major improvements to the training facilities were accomplished, and this enabled Fort McCoy to effectively support combined arms training. And uh, Fort McCoy was training now about 100,000 military personnel annually by 1985. And those figures represent more than one million man-made days of use each year. And Fort McCoy's reputation as an excellent winter training site grew as several active components uh, trained at Fort McCoy, as well as elements of the Marine Corps conducted their winter training here before moving on to Norway. During this decade, some of the largest reserve component training exercises in the history of the Army occurred at Fort McCoy. So many of you may be familiar with the term BRAC, base realignment and closure, but a lot of people focus on base closure. So with the closing of Fort Sheraton and Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, Fort McCoy has become more visible as the only major installation located in the north central United States. As a training installation, Fort McCoy has much to offer and more than 150,000 personnel who use the post and its facilities each year. To date, BRAC actions have served the post well, because remember there's part of that relocation in BRAC and that's what we've received. Um, and they've redefined and expanded Fort McCoy's support role and visibility throughout the Army. Uh, Fort McCoy's role as a major mobilization site was evident during Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield. More than 18,000 soldiers from 148 separate units and 3,400 items of equipment were deployed and redeployed at Fort McCoy. So Fort McCoy processed and deployed 8% of the total reserve component forces called to active duty. In the 90s, we began with our first major new construction since 1942. So since 1990, more than a quarter of a billion dollars in new construction buildings and ranges has occurred. Recent construction includes uh, preparation for a quad of four-story barracks buildings as well as support as well as supportive buildings. And when we move to uh, Fort McCoy has supported many national defense missions, including Operation Iraqi Freedom and during Freedom, Noble Eagle, and New Dawn after 9-11. More than 140,000 military personnel from 49 states and two territories mobilized or demobilized since 9-11. Most recently, we experienced Operation Allies Welcome. You're probably aware that Fort McCoy processed about 13,000 Afghan allies through Fort McCoy. The Department of Homeland Security and the State Department ran the operations and we provided support such as barracks to them. Speaking of barracks, uh, we have recently relocated four of the World War II barracks to new locations. I think it's 
forest interest uh, interested people, you'd be um, happy to hear that. And these relocated barracks save the taxpayers money and save Fort McCoy time in not having to build new buildings. So those World War II buildings were initially meant to last for six years. They're over 80 years now. Uh, we hope they'll last at least 80 years more, if not into perpetuity. And we've relocated four of those buildings and it's a proof of concept. And so we plan on relocating more of those buildings. One thing to note about those World War II buildings is most of them were built with wood from Fort McCoy itself. And this was back when a two by four was actually a two by four. So that's very good wood. And today you'd think that Fort McCoy is no longer the mo in the mobilization business, our numbers would go down, or that Fort McCoy is going out of business and closing, something like that. But that is not true. Fort McCoy is a steady mobilization site. I'm sure that you understand oops, sure that you understand that, but I'm here to set the record straight. Um, we trained more than 155,000 troops uh, and between 2004 and 2010, we were running 115,000 troops through here. And uh, we've been able to manage to keep that number above 100,000 troops and we're not going to be seeing anything uh, changing. And we've pretty much hit our training capabilities during the high training months, the spring, summer, fall months. And so we've looked into winter weather training and we've been pretty successful with that. And we'll see where that takes us. So because Fort McCoy is so well known, we also have a significant economic impact. Uh, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to the surrounding communities? Well, it means about two and a half billion dollars a year in economic impact around here. Uh, we don't just pull that figure out of the air. There's uh, economic formulas applied to this from purchasing, payroll, construction, contracts to, dis to this and that. And uh, I'm going to move over here to the slides you guys cannot see. Okay. It did. It did. If I just let it go, let it go. So there was, there was one item in here that was really interesting that Alan McCoy um, told me, and it was on the first page. I don't know if you guys caught it, that General McCoy's wife was the first automobile fatality for La Crosse County. And that's just something to say about all that back then, you know, no, um, no safety in the vehicles, no seat belts, anything like that. I'm going to bring this up slowly over here. Maybe it'll click back in. So I want to tell you guys about our commemorative area. The commemorative area is um, some World War II buildings, and we have World War II vignettes inside there. Of note, we have a dining facility, which is my favorite. We also have an administrative building, a building that shows training, um, tents for deployments, as well as barracks, a chapel, and a day room. And one of those buildings, you're able to go see what the latrines were like when people used them back then. I mean, you, if you aren't able to make it tomorrow, let me tell you, there, there are four toilets, and there are four toilets on this side, and there's no partition in them. So there are stories about guys coming and they remember playing cards back there. <laughs> you always need something to do. We also have a history center, which is like a museum, and uh, it is really interesting. As you go clockwise around the room, it tells the history of Fort McCoy, but it also tells the history of the Army and the Army Reserve. And I highly recommend, if you're not able to make tomorrow's tour, that you come out uh, during Armed Forces Day, the third Saturday in May, or check our summer hours, because I'm trying to have it two Friday afternoons a month during the summer. And what I want to do now is to thank you for inviting me here. I really, I, I love giving this information and you guys are so interested in it. It's just, it's a perfect match. And uh, so thank you for inviting me here today. And I want to open it not just to questions, but to discussion, especially since a lot of you have been to Fort McCoy.
Yes, sir. as well as German American. Yes. And maybe Ryan will go into that in more detail. For some reason in the last couple of years, I've had a lot of interest in not just the POW portion of it, but in the intern portion of internment portion of it, because there are descendants who are interested about what happened here. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you said that um, the, um, the uh, barrack buildings were like set up overnight. Many of those barrack buildings were from the PCC. Uh, they made that transition. When the camps were closed, that this was the supply base that they came back to. Um, if the DNR or the Forest Service didn't have any use for the bear buildings, they came back to. And interestingly, when um, people came here to set up the buildings, they needed some place to stay. So they were staying with local families, but they were also staying in the barracks as they were building them. So, yeah. so those buildings were also, uh, there was a very large um, compound, if you will, uh, at Whitmill Park, um, because it was so close to uh, Mitchell Field, that, that was the air base uh, for pilots testing airplanes and so forth. See, I learned something new too. Anybody else have anything that they want to? Yes, sir. Maybe this is beyond your thought. Um, do you know much of anything about Volk Field? I don't have history on Volk Field. Thank you very much. Yes. Can you comment on the fire? I can. The uh, You guys may have read in the newspaper that the uh, Army Reserve, they uh, investigated and they determined that the um, April 12th prescribed burn did not cause the uh, wildfire. It, they were unable to determine exactly what did. How many acres were there? So let, let's just approximate it, about 3,000 acres, all but less than 50 of them were on Fort McCoy. So about 2,500 on Fort McCoy, 2,550. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd like yes. to uh, bring up, we're having a, a talk a little later about the radio, radiation research with the Forest Service with the mining of it. And I know um, I read newspaper articles from the 60s about some of that was done on Fort McCoy too. Uh, is your office aware of any of that? Or have any I think Ryan is the one who's been involved with that. And I know that the um, Uni University of Wisconsin Physics Department was interested in uh, that information also. So there has started to be more and more interest in that. But he, save all these questions for him. He'll have the answers. <laughs> and as far as the question about fires, uh, that fire on Fort McCoy, the, the um, individuals that were basically uh, on that fire would be here giving a talk on the next week or so. So Charles Menzel, um, I don't know if he was the burn boss, uh, during that time, but um, you can ask him and he might be able to give some more detailed information on that. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting um, to watch everybody come together, the, the state, the federal, the local. It was, it was really impressive watching that. And then I don't know if you guys were aware that it was a high, high um, fire season. They, they came from Nasita. And then uh, while we were dealing with things, a fire broke out on South Post, which was miles away, and have no idea how, how that one started. And they were able to put that one out very quickly because we already had people here. So very appreciative to those people. Yes, ma'am. Um, question about the internment and all of that. Did, where, where were those people coming from? Um, were they from the West? Or? Mostly the West Coast. Some of them might have been um, the Midwest, especially I would um, think the Germans. Uh, a gentleman contacted me and his father had lived in the Midwest and he was interned here. So were these families, family buildings from the West Coast? 
Yes, it was. Yes, Jared. Tanya, are the boundaries of what will get fixed, or will they ultimately expand? So, never say never. <laughs> you, you never know. Um, I I read something about the farms uh, disappearing in Wisconsin, and we have a lot of farm neighbors. So, does that may mean that we may end up purchasing some of those? I don't know. It's it's a sad state, but the dairy farm industry has just exponentially gone down around the U.S. and especially around uh, Wisconsin. I think a big portion of them are here in Monroe County. So we'll, we'll see what the future holds on that. So then uh, there's another program, and I can't remember the name of it, uh, about working with landowners adjacent to Fort McCoy um, to try to prevent more development, more housing coming close to the border. Uh, do, are you aware of that program? I don't have a lot of information on that. I can't remember what it's called now, but, uh, but that's a big issue with uh, farm adjacent nationwide where everybody's building right up to the Nation boundary, and because uh, it's all just open land, and I even had one person ask me uh, when I was working there. Um, he was from the Forest Service. He's retired and wanted to move into this area, and he says, "Well, there's a piece of land right next to Fort McCoy. Um, you know, I'm thinking of buying it, but it's not that noisy, is it?" Uh, and I said, "Well, it's an army base, and you're with it was right near Range Seven. He was within, you know, less than a quarter mile from a range, and so I had him call the public affairs officer at that time." He decided not to buy the land, but yeah, there's a lot of people that move into these areas, and then they then they want to shut down training because it's noisy. So, uh, so that's a problem that, that all the army bases are having. And if it's not noisy, it's wet, because our parade field practically turns into a lake when it rains a lot. And that's one thing that we're doing. We're um, preserving our buildings by. Uh, uh, doing some preventive measures. We're going to see if we need to raise our buildings, put a, a taller foundation under them, maybe raise the sidewalks next to, next to them also. So it allows the water to not uh, get to the foundations. And that's another way to make those barracks that were supposed to be six years lasting to make them last longer. Anybody else? Any more questions for Tanya? Um, and, and real quick with uh, with the wetlands, the mm -hmm. water you're talking about, most of Fort McCoy controlment was built in a wetland, and there's drainage mm -hmm. issues going through it. But yeah, like you say, on a good heavy rain, it still floods and holds a lot of water. So recently I heard uh, the commemorative area, it's kind of in an awkward block, let's say. It's like, why didn't the barracks go on? Why didn't the buildings go on? Well, I heard somebody say, um, that it's it may be the wettest part on the installation and when they were digging uh, water just kept coming in and they weren't able to put down more foundations. I don't know if that's true or not but it sure sounds like it was a possibility because that place just gets soaked. It is a wetland. It is. <laughs> so anyways if no more questions and, and Tanya you, you've saved us a whole lot of time and we don't have anybody ready to come before break but do uh, you want to say I'm something? Okay well um, Okay. Thank you to Tanya. Thank you.